people's priests, or priests hired by municipalities to care for their people, carried many of Luther's ideas and ideas related to the Reformation movement across Europe. The spread of these ideas among the common people of Europe has been referred to as what else but the, quote, Reformation of the common man. One such people's priest is Ulrich Zwingli. Um, he lived in Zurich. And about the same time Luther made his stand in Germany, Zwingli was relying more and more on the Bible and his sermons and less and less on church tradition. Now, ultimately, Zwingli convinced the city council of Zurich to side with him and other reformers in a public debate over religious issues and effectively ended the control of the church over Zurich. Zwingli's ideas presented in his 67 conclusions included the rejection of monastic life, the rejection of the idea of purgatory, the rejection of clerical celibacy, and the belief that only God can forgive sins. Things tra changed dramatically in Zurich over the following years. Uh, services no longer included the Mass, and religious images or icons disappeared from churches. Christianity in Zurich looked less and less like Catholicism every year. That phenomenon spread from town to town as Europe moved deeper into the Reformation. Now, Zwingli even went so far as to uh, denounce the idea of sacraments. Um, he believed that baptism and Holy Communion were just merely symbolic and and very ritualized, whereas L Luther believed that they were necessary for salvation. Uh, remember, th he believed they were the only two sacraments necessary for salvation. Now, while many contemporaries of Luther sought alternatives to the church, not all of them agreed with Luther on theology. Uh, for many, Luther and maybe it was because of the Holy Communion and Baptism, but Luther remained too Catholic for their tastes. Um, Zwingli is a prime example of this feeling. While Luther believed in consubstantiation, that means that the bread and wine during Holy Communion actually become the body and blood of Christ, uh, Zwingli argued that the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper merely symbolized the body and blood of Christ. Uh, for the most part, though, Protestants were pretty much on the same page. The first public forum for Protestants was held at the Colloquy of Marburg in 1529. Protestants, including Luther and Zwingli, agreed on 14 different Protestant ideas, but they failed to find consensus regarding the Lord's Supper. Interestingly, in the name of unity and cooperation, Zwingli agreed to disagree with Luther on that point, but Luther would have nothing to do with it. Uh, Luther and Zwingli eventually published work after work bashing one another for their beliefs about the Lord's Supper, but thankfully for the Protestant movement, the debate didn't deter many Europeans from turning away from Catholicism the way Luther and Zwingli had. In 1531, civil war erupted in Switzerland between Catholics and the followers of Zwingli. Zwingli was wounded in a battle and later discovered by Catholic forces, who then killed him, quartered him, and burned his body. The war ended with a treaty stating Zurich would remain Protestant and other Swiss states, or cantons as they're known, would remain Catholic. Luther's ideas spread quickly from Germany and caught the attention of many believers throughout Europe. One such person, who eventually would leave his own undeniable mark on the Reformation movement, was John Calvin. Calvin respected Luther and Luther's ideas, but he had in mind yet another form of Christianity different from the Church and from Lutheranism. Calvin envisioned a form of Christianity somewhat different than the Catholic Church and even different from the Reformed Church Luther initially wanted. Calvin would get the chance to help develop his branch of Christianity in the city of Geneva.
Until the 1530s, Geneva, Switzerland remained a predominantly Catholic city loyal to Rome and to the church. Geneva, however, was far from a holy or even righteous city. The materialism that gripped other cities, including Rome, also influenced Geneva. In an attempt to reform the church in Geneva and the city itself, a reformer named Guillaume Farrell worked with the people in Geneva who were interested in Protestantism. Now, at first behind closed doors and then later in public, Farrell called for change. After being called before a council in 1532, he was reprimanded and run out of town, in fact. Uh, Farrell ba barely escaped. He didn't stay gone long, though, and he returned to Geneva in 1533. Somehow, after two years of hard work, Farrell managed to turn the city toward Protestantism. In 1535, the Council of 200, the dominant city council in Geneva, officially adopted Protestantism for the city. As in other towns touched by Protestantism, Geneva did away with Mass and the icons. Geneva went a step further, though. The council passed new laws that enforced strict guidelines on the behavior of its citizens, laws that banned things like gambling, dancing, and other unruly behavior. In reality, the laws did little to change the city. In the midst of the struggle to get Geneva back on track, Farrell encountered a young man traveling through Geneva on his way to Strasbourg, a man named John Calvin. Born not far from Paris, John Calvin received a terrific education as a young man. He began theology studies at the age of 14 and continued them until his father decided John should be a lawyer. John studied law and the humanities for a few years until his father died, and then he resumed studies that included Greek and Hebrew. Hebrew. Not long after he renewed his religious studies, John had a change of heart about religion and the church. Unfortunately, his interest in Protestantism came at a time when Protestants were being persecuted in and around Paris, so he left Paris and he knocked around for a few years. It was on his way to Strasbourg that he ran into Farrell and his life changed forever. Farrell was so impressed by Calvin that he extended him an invitation to stay in Geneva and help spread Protestantism. Calvin refused over and over until Farrell basically threatened to place a curse on him if he didn't stay and help. How could Calvin say no to that? Calvin faced an uphill battle in a city that seemed apathetic toward religion and downright immoral. Calvin's challenge was to change not only what people believed, but also how they acted. Calvin and Farrell drew up a list of articles that the city councils adopted in 1537. Included in these articles were rules that created an early curfew, it banned gambling, card playing, dancing, and lewd songs. Citizens faced severe punishment for breaking these rules. The citizens of Geneva didn't take kindly to Calvin's theocracy, nor to a government with laws based on a system of religious beliefs and values. A group known as the Libertines challenged Calvin's ideas, eventually taking control of the councils and ordering Calvin to lay off the people of Geneva. Finally, after a dispute arose over the Lord's Supper on, of all days, Easter Sunday, the Council of 200 banished Calvin and Farrell. Farrell went one way and Calvin the other to Strasbourg, where he further refined his theology. While Calvin was busy working, writing, and getting married in Strasbourg, Geneva fell into disarray. When the Council of 200 felt it had no alternative, it asked Calvin to return and get the city headed in the right direction again. Hesitantly, he did return. Calvin immediately had the council pass a new constitution for the church in Geneva. He established a rigorous routine. He taught, he preached, he wrote, he debated. He was determined to have an effect on the city this time around. To benefit the citizens of Geneva, he helped build new hospitals, schools, and industries, but these improvements came at a price. Basically, Calvin was no less bossy than the first time and he established a panel of 12 men called the Consistory, who oversaw the discipline of lawbreakers, specifically those who opposed Calvinism. 
What must have seemed like a good idea at the time resulted in a very strict system of rules. To enforce the rules and to punish violators, the consistory often tortured and banished people. Occasionally, they excommuted and even executed serious criminals. While this punishment seems extremely harsh, execution for heresy took place on a regular basis all over Europe in the days of Calvin and Luther. And strangely enough, such treatment of non-believers fell in line with the theology of Calvin and his followers, a theology that was organized in a rather systematic manner, unlike Luther's theology. One of the best examples of the harshness of Calvin's theocracy in Geneva was the case of Michael Servetus here. He was a Spaniard who happened to escape the Spanish Inquisition. And after Servetus arrived in Geneva, it was discovered that he was a Unitarian. He denied the existence of the Trinity, or God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That didn't sit well with Calvin. Servetus refused to recant, and Calvin allowed him to be burned at the stake. In 1536, Calvin published the first edition of his landmark work, Institutes of the Christian Religion, one of the most definitive volumes concerning Protestant beliefs. He later revised the work several times and expanded his system each time. In order to understand his system, you have to remember that he had a background in law and logic. Calvin didn't use it, but you can use the acronym TULIP to remember his system of theology. Calvin, as evidenced in his Theocracy in Geneva, believed that the civic or state government should be subject to the laws of God. This is in stark contrast to Luther, who believed that the two should be separate and that the church should be subordinate to the laws of a just earthly government. The church, according to Calvin, existed to help the elect live just lives, lives that would make the elect worthy of being called Christians. Arguably, Calvin's role in the Reformation was second only to Luther's with regard to the impact and influence of his actions and theology. So the least you need to know, John Calvin established a theocracy in Geneva, Switzerland, where the city council kept its citizens in line with a strict moral code. And he published his theology in Institutes of the Christian Religion. Central to his theology was the belief in predestination. There you have it, Calvinism in less than 13 minutes. Thanks for listening.